Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Noon. I'm your host this evening, Lawrence Ray. And today I'm joined by my esteemed co hosts, uh, Ricardo Martinez and Jerry. And today we are interviewing the amazing Jameson Lock. And uh, Jameson, before I ask how you're doing, I'll uh, give you a quick intro to our audience, if anyone who hasn't heard of you or come across you so far. So, Jameson is the uh, CEO and co founder of Casa, uh, a cypherpunk, uh, Bitcoin Times editor. Uh, creator of some pretty useful beginner Bitcoin resources um, and overall privacy advocate. So uh, how are you doing today, Jameson? I'm doing well, hanging in there, uh, just trying to start to enjoy some uh, summer sun and uh, you know, watching the loft lockdowns all get lifted, uh, taking advantage of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm partying. For, well, I mean, yeah, it's been delayed a bit in the UK, but overall, right direction everywhere. So that's uh, positive for sure. But yeah, I guess, uh, well, we'll just dig in and sort of start asking you questions straight off the bat. So um, the, one of the first things um, I guess I wanted to bring up um, was something that's been in the news a lot recently. Uh, and I'm nearly sick of talking about it, but not quite, which is uh, El Salvador. Um, and yeah, essentially, it's all over the, the Bitcoin news world specifically at the moment, and rightfully so. Um, but I guess one thing I wanted to sort of speak about was just like getting your um, thoughts on when it was announced that El Salvador was going to kind of bring on Bitcoin as legal tender, and then kind of like how that may have changed or developed uh, over the last kind of couple of weeks, as we've seen the developments with the president and the volcano power and all these different things. Um, I just wanted to see kind of, yeah, what, what you thought about it originally and, and how that's changed. Well, interestingly enough, I went back through my tweets because I felt like it was a momentous enough event that I had probably talked about something like this happening before. And I actually had a tweet about four years ago in which I made a bold prediction that there would be a nation state that uh, essentially set Bitcoin as their currency. And I, at the time, I said, I think it'll happen in the next five years. I was probably feeling pretty bullish at the time. Um, and, uh, you know, just by sheer luck uh, it happened you know within the time frame that i had guessed but my my main point with all of that is like i felt like it was inevitable obviously you know predicting timelines on these things is very hard but it it's a logical thing to do especially if you're a tiny little nation that is essentially at the whim of other nations or uh, large central banking organizations that are essentially uh, holding you hostage. Uh, you know, if you're not large enough and powerful enough to have your own currency, then it makes sense to choose a currency that is more predictable, that uh, is more favorable uh, towards you and, and your citizens. So from that standpoint, I felt like we we're kind of overdue for it. Um, I think it, it was actually a little bit surprising that it was El Salvador, which is, I mean, they're not a large country, but they're also not one of the smallest. I, I kind of assumed it would be a micro nation of some sort, you know, basically really bottom of the ladder type of nation that's like barely even recognized as a nation. But, um, you yeah, know, I think this is a very interesting development because it makes the other nations that are in similar situations start to take notice. And, you know, it's, it's really how you get the ball rolling on this type of stuff. Uh, once the dominoes start falling, you know, that's when I think macro changes are really going to start happening. And, and even more than just the announcement itself, um, the reaction in the days after and really the actions of the president to, to go further than just simply make a empty proclamation. He's actually putting resources into this. I think we're going to see actual boots on the ground type of action uh, to try to form uh, you know, grassroots movements uh, within this uh, nation to get as many people as possible onboarded to the world's most sound money. And, 
you know, it's not going to be easy. It's going to take a lot of work, but you know, if this is a success and we can create a reproducible model for it, then I think you're going to see a lot of Bitcoiners start to go out uh, to other nations and essentially offer to help uh, reproduce that and onboard uh, many, many more people. Now there's, you know, there's going to be a lot of technical challenges, educational challenges and whatnot, but I think that this is the type of thing that a lot of us have been waiting to see. It's a one small step, but one giant leap forward. Yeah, that's a good way to summarize it at the end there. And yeah, I, it's something that I, I kind of felt might be a few years on from now, but so it kind of surprised me. Um, I, I think the other thing that surprised me is like the um, the speed and efficacy at which like he's act, the president's actually acted on it. Essentially, it's like, yeah, Bill's going through. And it was like, oh, okay. I, I didn't expect it to be that fast, which has just impressed me basically, um, to be honest. Now, of course, this, this may be a result of some attributes of El Salvador that are perhaps uh, less uh, desirable for a lot of us uh, liberty-minded people. You know, whenever whenever I see a government that's able to take really, really swift action, it makes me suspect that it's probably more on the authoritarian side. Uh, so, you know, this isn't... I, I think this is what you're seeing a lot of pushback from uh, uh, people talking about El Salvador and the problems that they have and how this is bad for Bitcoin that they're trying to do this stuff. But I think that those of us who understand the system reasonably well, we understand that you know the actual technology, it's a tool, it's neutral, it can be used for good things and bad things. And you know we're going to keep an, an eye on it and and see you know exactly how this gets rolled out in the country but uh you know just because there may be some people with questionable backgrounds or whatever using it that does not at all detract from the utility uh the 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 value of this protocol it it kind of all goes back down to one of the original i guess concerns that a lot of people have about bitcoin which is that it's good for criminals but uh, you know my pushback to that is that uh, at the end of the day we're all criminals one way or another you just choose your flavor of criminality speaking of criminals did you ever get to the bottom of who swatted you and were the perpetrators ever brought to justice not really um so suffice to say I got a number of clues, uh, uh, some good leads came in, um, but it was never enough, I think, to actually get law enforcement to step in. And, you know, the, the burden of proof uh, is pretty high on a lot of these things. And I think the short version is, my interactions with law enforcement basically led me to come to the understanding that I was not a high priority. Um, you know, they're, they're more concerned with people who are in imminent danger or uh, people who are you know, serial major criminals that are, you know, basically stealing millions of dollars uh, from lots of folks and, I did not fit in that category. So the only thing that I can really hope for at this point is karma that, you know, if whoever is out there, this is not the only bad thing that they've done. I suspect that uh, this is kind of the life that they live and that eventually it's going to catch up to them. There's a situation where obviously you've been swatted before and obviously anyone who's listening um, that has occurred just in case anyone didn't, wasn't aware. Um, I know that obviously we're, uh, with the way that you've been since or has been to kind of um, focus a lot on privacy and safeguarding your data and your personal information, which makes sense to me. Um, but I guess there's people out there who probably will be listening and think, well, you know, it's not happened to me. I've not had anything really bad happen to me. Um, essentially, why should I care about my my privacy to the to the similar level or even half the level that, that you do um why should i make an effort basically um and i didn't know if there was any kind of words of wisdom or, or warning that you had for people who may think well you know like i don't need to worry i've not got tons of cash or it's not happened to me yet um i didn't know there's anything you kind of would have to say to those people basically after the experiences that you've been through uh, in your life well you know my 
particular situation was an extreme case. Obviously, only a very tiny portion of the population is ever going to have a SWAT team show up at their house because they're being extorted and targeted by some criminal on the internet. However, there are many, many other things that can go wrong with regard to having privacy leaks. And this is really just common cyber hygiene, cybersecurity is that over a long enough period of time, it's basically a guarantee that any information that you're sharing with other service providers, you know, other websites, other apps, whatever, some of that is going to leak. Uh, some of those databases are going to get compromised. Uh, ultimately, that data is going to end up getting sold on various darknet markets. Uh, it may even just get simply dumped into the public. And then the, the question becomes, uh, what is going to happen as a result of that? I think the most common thing that happens is identity theft. You know, if your personally identifiable information gets leaked, then savvy criminals will be able to essentially leech off of your uh, credit and, you know, pretend to be you, um, open up various lines of credit and, uh, that will be a very long and arduous process for you to try to clean up. It can easily take years uh, to clean up that type of mess. So I think just from a, a simple uh, protective type of perspective, if you just limit the amount of data that you're putting out there in the first place, that's really the best thing that you can do to prevent a whole slew of things that you may not even be thinking about that can go wrong. Okay.